a national mapping agency who is so kind of in tune and um, positive, working towards everybody's interests in the industry at the moment. Uh, I think it's marvellous, and I have to say it wasn't always so, because when I started out, round right about turn of the millennium, um, it started to make maps. I think from memory it was about an hour after morning tea on the first day that I realised I didn't have any data. And um, so I trundled down to Linz, as you would think you would do. I needed to discover the place was fenced up tighter than Fort Knox, and we had gatekeepers there. Um, we've come an awful long way in the last 20 years, and I think it's all been really positive with open data policy and the rest, and working on everybody's, um, on everybody's interests. And uh, yeah, it's good to see such a forward-looking organisation. And I think the only time that perhaps Aaron looks backwards is to see if there's something there that he might do better um, next time. And that's all quite topical with the, his forthcoming talk, which is about the future of maps. And it's doubly relevant because there's half a dozen of us here who were discussing the very same topic in Redlands earlier in the year. And um, so we're going to be very interested, Aaron, to see your take. Um, thanks, Robin, for those uh, very kind words. In fact, quite humbling, I have to say. The topic, the future of maps, um, is quite a loaded term. Uh, sort of, and so I'm going to sort of ease some of the, the, the pressure out of the room here and say there is no big reveal. Um, <laughs> but uh, I believe that mapping is a journey, um, or mapping has been a journey and continues to be a journey and, and will forever be a journey. Um, so I'm going to take you through, I guess, a slice of that um, over the next uh, 50 minutes or so. First of all, um, I'll just talk a little bit about Linz in case um, some of you don't know too much about us. Um, we currently have a vision which is the power of where will drive New Zealand success. Um, and behind that, we also have three strategic goals. Our first one is increasing the use of geographic information. Our second one is unlocking the value of property. And our third is improving resilience to national, uh, to national uh, natural events. But we are quite a diverse organisation. Uh, we, we do lots and lots of different things. Um, and we manage approximately 8% of, of New Zealand's land uh, as, as Crown land. Um, and that includes the red zone in the Port, in the port Hills uh, around Christchurch at the moment. Um, we obviously manage the Survey and Titles Register. Um, we manage our the geodetic infrastructure, our positioning infrastructure, the, we do hydrograph, hydrographic charting, um, we manage addresses, um, and we just distribute lots of data. And of course, <coughs> we make maps. Why do we map? Um, we map to, des to describe land, to des defend it, to explore it, navigate it, and to manage it. And this leads to a safe and secure society. Maps are also used to help us understand, analyse, uh, inform, and that leads us to a resilient and prosperous uh, society in a healthier environment. And maps, as we've heard many times over the last three days, tell a story. Um, and this, uh, you'll see, is a part of the red zone in Christchurch as it's transitioned over, over the last five years or so, and you'll hear more about that in Cray and Jump Speak uh, later today. And our, our maps tell the story of the natural and built environment. Just so you know, get an idea about where we map. Sorry, this isn't a fantastic map in itself, but it was a quick one I could get my hands on. Um, where the white text is illustrates where, where, we, where we are responsible for mapping. Um, so obviously it includes New Zealand, it's offshore islands, South Pacific um, interest there, and also down around Antarctica. So we have quite a large area in which we're responsible for mapping, and Igor, in fact, covered some of that uh, yesterday and the day before. Uh, before I pick up where Chris left off the other day, I will just do a quick recap, just in case some people weren't in the room for that. Linz has a very deep history um, in making maps. We, um, with the, um, we were established first in, in 1876, and that was um, the Department of Lands and Survey, and that existed for 111 years, which is an amazing amount of time in itself. You heard the story of the transition into Dosley from Chris yesterday, and that lasted for about nine years. And Linz, in fact, celebrated its um, 20th anniversary just this July gone. So um, we've been going pretty strong as well. Chris mentioned back in the, in the 1930s we started our first national mapping series and, and we worked on that for, a, for a quite a number of decades uh, into the uh, 1970s. We went metric as a country and we, of course we had to respond to that with a metric-based um, map. Um, so in 
uh, in the 1970s we started um, a, a new map series and we completed that um, in the late 90s. So it took a couple of decades to get there, and in fact we were still doing that. We were using that as our national mapping series for, for three, almost three decades, or just on three decades, in fact. And then we had a change in positioning. Um, and we, the GNS positioning became much more um, common, and we wanted to change our datum to reflect that. Um, so we had a change in datum that triggered yet another map series as we moved into another projection. Um, and this is the Topo 50 that, um, that we have today. Map mating itself, again just recapping what, what um, uh, Chris went through yesterday, I'm not going to do his dance. Um, <laughs> I was never trained on that stuff so I won't, I won't, even, won't even try. But just a reminder that there are quite a lot of different technologies in play, um, both in, uh, uh, in getting the data off and then representing it. Um, and of course through the 80s we started doing the digitiza digitization, and this is really the 260 series is, the, is where most of our data come from for our current map series and this, the digitization of that really began back in the 80s and we completed that in, two, in, in 2000. So today what we're doing is we're primarily working off computer screens um, and extracting um, information directly off imagery and representing that into a map. Um, Chris mentioned as well, this pre-press, it's a very, it is a wonderful thing, we leverage it like nothing else, it's an excellent piece of technology, um, and yeah, the ability to now produce maps within minutes is, is um, really incredible, to, in my opinion. So just in summary, um, that's our current workflow, so we, we extract it, we represent, rep make some uh, assessment around how that's going to look, and then we put it through the pre-press and we get our maps. And we cover off quite a lot of different tricky things, obviously. Chris went through some of the smarts, but you know, to glaciers, to um, the, the hill shading, to the, the text, the um, building representation, the road representation, all this stuff is happening automatically, which is really cool. We also make all our data and maps available, or the maps available online uh, by the map, map chooser, and we were doing this from um, about 2011-ish, I understand. Um, and maybe even a bit earlier, um, that makes people that makes it a lot more um, accessible for people. So the team were interviewed uh, earlier this year, um, and it's on Radio New Zealand website. Um, if you haven't heard it, it's about, it's about a 15 minute um, uh, talk. It's really interesting, uh, and uh, you get a real sense of what the guys are doing on a day to day basis. So imagery as well, before 2010 ish. We've we started collecting imagery in the 1930s, um, it was black and white, we moved into colour at some point, um, then also we dabbled in uh, satellite imagery for some time as well, trying to uh, get um, uh, a map from that, um, which had some trials and tribulations as we did that. That sort of gives you a flavour up to about 2010-ish. Um, also, uh, before I sort of go on from there, I just want to recognise that the world was also changing through this time. We had Google Maps come along um, and that really changed people's perspective on how to interact with maps. Um, they weren't the first to do it but they managed to do it across the globe very successfully. Uh, the ability to zoom right out and go anywhere in the world and zoom right in again um, and, and see what, what's on the ground and that, that really has changed. I think it made a big shift in, in the way people interact with maps. Obviously they weren't the only ones. Uh, there was big maps came along uh, we had Apple Maps and there, and there are plenty others. I'm waiting to see if we get Facebook Maps at some point. Um, it just seems like the thing to do if you're in that industry. Of course, to, to counteract the fact um, that, that all the data and stuff is locked up in those other um, uh, products, uh, Open, Open Street Map was born um, to, to allow, let's say, the people to own the data and, and produce the map um, and take the data and, and, and and do what they like with it. So we had open street maps come along as well. We started getting a lot of in-car navigation. It started with something attached to your screen. It wasn't too long before it came built into the dashboard of your of your of your car, and this helped us get around the world a lot a lot differently as well. Sometimes not always accurately. Um, of course, we have the smartphone. Um, smartphone then comes preloaded in, in maps as well. So this is again another step change where we we no, no longer have to. Um, let's say know we're exactly where we are on a map, we can have the phone tell us exactly where we are on a map. Tablets also came along, again we've got more maps on there, and now we've got smartwatches, in fact I've got one of my own, uh, just got on uh, 
on Saturday and I've been playing around with the maps on there. And of course they do have maps. Um, what I think is interesting is um, the, the, obviously this, the size of the screen is quite small but I've, I've heard a talk from a designer and he said it's not the screen size that, that makes it difficult, it's the session time. So that we're only looking at it for a few seconds, so representing what you need to tell the person using it um, in such a short amount of time is, is the challenge, so it's interesting. I think that train looking uh, diagram up there, or picture up there, sort of illustrates a very quick snapshot of, of, of the journey ahead of someone, rather than necessarily the full detail of what's in the doing. In response to some of this stuff, um, Lynn's decided that um, we needed to do some more or better open data and also start doing some coordination of data as well. In 2011, the Lynn's data service was launched. Um, it contains uh, all, all of our mapping data, but it contains a lot of other data in Lynn's as well, um, including the survey and titles data, um, our hydrographic information, um, and, and, and a ton more. From a topo perspective, we have um, 140 layers, roughly, of the topo 50 map series in there, um, and we group them into different um, bits and pieces. Uh, it's, it's a lot of data um, to manage, um, but it's, it's obviously very rich for others to get access to. Then we have imagery. So imagery, um, <coughs> you saw the history in the, where we did a lot of flying. We, there was a time. When we went into the, um, where we weren't doing much flying ourselves, um, uh, we, we looked at the satellite imagery space. Um, then, then we thought, hang on a second, we could probably do better here. The councils were flying imagery, um, but that wasn't readily accessible. We got into imagery coordination, and this enabled us um, to take the country from about five percent of, of, of New Zealand. Um, being covered by open imagery, uh, aerial imagery, to about 95% of the country covered um, in a very short space of time, within about a year. And now we actively run this program. Um, this was last year, last summer's program, in the, in the, in the coloured spots there of where we flew imagery, um, in coordination with all those people, all those organisations, and their logos represented there. It's a much better way of doing it, and of course we make all this available, available for free on the, on the LDS, so for everyone to consume. And this enables the LDS, um, a, a, the data service, and enables other applications to come to life um, using our data for, for uh, um, not necessarily the intended purpose of the data which was originally collected for. So um, we've had people tell us how they used our data to design um, wind farms. Um, we've had Roger's maps on TV, of weather maps, and he obviously did access our data in the end uh, to, to do that. Um, and we have New Zealand Police using our data to help solve crimes, um, to, you know, to understand terrain and things where things might go. On the picture on the right bottom is uh, landscape architects is another interesting niche market where they, they can now do a lot of um, using the imagery in particular, um, the groundwork at, on their, on the, at their desktop and understand exactly what's going to be, need to be done there so they can turn up on site um, with some ready made ideas and plans. More applications, people are taking our maps, our digital versions, um, running websites and offering them up to customers in an online way, um, in fact allowing people to go and print uh, off their home, <coughs> home printer and take that into the field. Um, and again, it's really great to see that this sort of stuff can happen uh, without, uh, without us getting involved. We've now got it on our, uh, the topo maps themselves sitting on our, on our phones. Um, I use it when I go walking just to check that I'm going the right way. Um, and it, uh, I think it's, just, it's great to see the number of um, the apps that are sitting there using our data. With all that change going on, um, just before 2015, we decided we needed a new strategy. So we went about under getting a better understanding. And in the end, we launched a new strategy in 2015. So I'll just walk you through the main trip um, points in this. We have five strategic goals inside the strategy. Our, our first is to actively engage with customers. Uh, our stakeholders and the international topographic community. So this means we really want to understand what people are doing, both with our products and with our data. Um, we need to know what the uh, key stakeholders, such as um, the Defence Force, Emergency Services, um, are doing with our maps and, and our data and how we can support them better. 
Um, and of course, we need to stay in touch with the international um, community so that we are keeping up with the trends, um, we're, we know what's going on in the techniques and, and tools that are in play, um, so that we can leverage that for New Zealand as well. The second goal is basically around um, setting ourselves some, some better um, guidance as to what, um, what we should be capturing. And so we really want to get the real world change into our data and onto our maps. Um, and, and considering the change that happens spatially, temporarily, and, and any other attribution that maximises its value. Um, so that's a challenge that we've got. We're still, we haven't landed um, any hard ones on that yet. Um, we're, we're still doing the discovery work there, but it's a challenge that we've set ourselves to get clear on what we want to achieve in that space. There's also, we've shifted our focus from purely just on the map product into the data itself, so that we, um, if we can put strength into the data, we give much better possibilities for ourselves as an organisation, but for others as well that can access our data. Goal three um, is about coordinating other sources of topographic data um, and building them into national data sets. This is uh, taking hold of that data focus, working with our local councils about what data they have, um, trying to get it into a standard um, format that we can then use into our maps but also publish it um, externally. Um, we, our main focus at the moment is on our rogues data sets, um, on our buildings data set and um, our rivers data set. They're all at various stages, um, you'll probably hear more about that from Greg later today, um, so I won't dwell on the detail there. But the, the concept is um, that they, a council is more interested in a feature than we are, so they'll be more likely to map it and maintain their information about it. If we can access it, then it saves us having to generate and manage that data ourselves. Our fourth goal, which is a little bit um, uh, of a special case of goal three, uh, where we want to continue this coordination of imagery, but also expand into elevation data, so that we can, um, again, maximise those opportunities uh, um, for New Zealand and, and our data users. Um, so, obviously, you, most of you guys in this room will know what elevation and 3D data is, so I won't go into um, talking about it too much in, in LiDAR. So, we do have a bit of a program going on at the moment um, where we're coordinating some of the uh, data that's available, uh, building point clouds, well, accessing the point clouds, um, which you can do some cool stuff like this, obviously. Um, and this is from Ian Reese, um, who's in the room somewhere, um, showing how detailed you can get just with, with just using LiDAR data in itself. So this is all that's there. Um, and you can see um, you know, the structure of the sky tower, um, all the detail of the buildings, and you can obviously rotate around that from multiple perspectives. And again, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted in the room, but this is an amazing amount of information that you can get um, and pull um, into many different applications. So I think it's really exciting to see. Um, from our perspective, a digital, a digital elevation model is something we're looking to achieve um, a higher resolution of. This is our current one, again, courtesy of Geographics, originally created it and we um, purchased. Um, but in Auckland, we now have the opportunity to take it down to a metre level, which you can see the difference in, in, in detail, it's quite, quite big. Um, and then with the surface model as well, you can get, really start to see the texturing of, of what sort of the landscape really feeling like. Our fifth goal is to move towards not just our paper-based products, but doing things specifically digitally, so that we are getting products for people who want to work in a digital environment. Um, you saw a different version of this from Chris yesterday, where last year we had that little crossover in downloads um, versus sales. Um, I'm sure we would need to do more insights into that to really understand if that's really a turning point or not. But it is an indicator, it's a little, little hint um, that tells us, hey, we can't just focus on, on the paper side. Uh, I, I truly believe we don't, we don't want to forget the paper side either. We, I do believe it has a long future. Um, but we have to also acknowledge that there's a big growing um, user base in the digital domain as well. We have to do something about it. Well, with our data focus, we enables us to also have a digital focus because we can uh, produce data that services both paper and digital products. Um, currently, we have the imagery base map sitting up online that you can access from the LIMS data service. Um, and we also have our, our base maps uh, of, our, of, our, of our topographic maps. And again, you heard from Chris yesterday, 
about our grid list ones that we did for um, the Defence Force uh, so that they could put their own grid on top of it uh, when they were uh, doing their work. Uh, we thought that was pretty cool, so we, we thought we'd make a base map of it. Uh, it's probably more suited than, than that one for actually consumption in a digital environment. We also have some uh, base maps that um, we've been desperately wanting to release for some time, um, and we just need to get over a few hurdles to get that, but there's a colour base map um, and also a graphite base map uh, that we've got, with, which allows us to zoom, uh, or zoom out and zoom in where we can change the content as we get uh, more and more, uh, larger and larger um, scale, which is, is more like the attuned to the Google style. But just to sort of, what is it that we're actually trying to do here? So, I've talked a lot at you for now, for, for a moment, and gone through various aspects of the process. So I thought I'd just try and recap the process a little bit. We have a very, this is, this is our world, and, it, and it's changing. And we, we're trying to understand it, interpret it, and represent it again in a different form. So, just to diagrammetrically, this is our earth. We measure it. This is, in our case, for mapping. We get some photographs, be it from satellite, aeroplane. We collect and store that information and hold it so that we can use it for up many things. We then go through the interpretation of that, and again, we saw a bit of that from Chris yesterday, how, how it used to be done, how it's done a bit now, and then even now it's, it's shifting again. We then simplify it um, and through various techniques. Um, and then we end up with a, well, a flat Earth, maybe. Um, I do find it ironic that since we've discovered that the world isn't flat, we actually prefer to represent it flat. Um, and, and of course, um, we've got the person in the middle who's, who's trying to understand, I'm in, in this real world on the left, um, but I have a representation of, of it on my right, and how do, I, how do I make this, how do I compare it, how do I make that work? And, and that's ultimately what I, I believe our tasks are, is to make that easy uh, to do that. What other applications are there um, it, for, for our data? Um, we can do flood modelling, um, and, and of course this is really important for um, your planning uh, for an event that can come, so you can know areas that you might need to evacuate or areas you might need to make more resilient in, in, in light of, of such information. Um, I've actually mixed two th things up. The, the picture on the left here is actually a, a, a rain flood event. Um, the one on the right is actually inundation from the sea, so not, not quite that, but it is the same area. And it gives you an impression of what, you know, Wellington City Council, for example, have the ability to actually get a better understanding about how, um, how their city will ha um, be affected by such an event. We also use this sort of stuff for in our consultation and comms. So this is when we want to predict the future. So we want to tell a story to someone about what a potential one potential future will look like. Um, this is a, on the left. You've got the eastern uh, so Tarawa Eastern Link, um, and on the right you've got um, the flyover around the basin reserve. And we use this to help people engage with the consultation process to make sure that they're happy with what we're going to get. There's a, um, a study down around Otago, I think it's Otago University sitting down here, um, around solar gain. Um, and again, it's just another application you can use. I know through Europe they use these sorts of things to understand where the best place to put solar panels on houses. Um, again, this 3D data allows us to, to get those sorts of answers. We also use it for compliance. So this is down in Queenstown, where they can, uh, what the official building envelope is, that's the green, um, and when you've protruded through that, then you're outside of compliance. So this is, allows council to understand, well, you, this is what you said you were going to build, um, and this is what you've actually built, and in fact, that's outside compliance. So you can use that to check um, that sort of stuff. Of course, then there's joining land and sea. Um, so our elevation data and our bathymetry data, um, joining that together um, is one of our challenges um, and our aspirations as an organisation to, to do. Um, it's, it's not easy um, because of the, the, well, there's a lot involved, um, datums and different technology, different data sets and everything. Um, but it, it'll have great value to be able to do that as we go from the wet to the dry seamlessly, um, understand how how uh, changes in particularly in sea level will affect the land, um, etc. And then of course you've got intelligent transport, um, who, which is just a, a really um, massive industry um, 
the way we, we will use our cars in the future um, are going to be radically different to the way we use it today. The smarts that are built into cars um, are already there, they'll only get smarter. And of course you need to know where these cars are going, what the train's like. Um, and, and again, a lot of this technology is already in play, uh, controlling vehicles around corners, um, accelerating up hills and all those sorts of things um, by knowing where they are and what to expect around the corner. Um, and again, I think this is only going to get more and more um, as we uh, progress into the future. And, and our role, particularly as an agency, of how to contribute into that um, is something that we're mindful of. Um, and uh, we do have connections into the transport sector and, and having conversations there. Um, just a little plug back to the Unfolding the Map exhibition. There's lots and lots of examples, obviously, of how all this stuff works um, in there. And so go and have a play on the tablets and stuff uh, if you haven't already, or else you can hit the web link. Um, a lot of those pictures I've just shown actually were given to me by EV Technology as well, so just a little plug for them on that. So, what else? So there's mobile mapping, um, and this is ha happening more and more. There's actually you know, multiple companies who are getting into this space uh, around the world, but also here in New Zealand. And this allows us to, uh, or allows them to scan the, the environment around the road, uh, which is gain rich information about that, both the, the road surface, but also those objects around it. Um, and, and you can use that again for your... Um, for lots of applications that include the, uh, the intelligent transport sector. Drones, um, I don't think I could talk about the future without drones. Um, these are becoming more and more prevalent. There was a good presentation by Pascal and Todd um, yesterday and they talked about some of the, the traps if you don't know quite what you're doing with this stuff. But the power of it is, is really, um, well, it, it, I think it's, it, will, it will set, um, set us up for quite an interesting future about how we manage our land going forward, and particularly at, at the real local scale, if you think about a farmer, um, if he can access a drone um, and, and manage or understand the yield that he's going to get or an agricultural farm um, from his crop, and he can sense that through sensors um, with just by a touch of a button or fly off, do a survey, come back, automatically process and give them an indicator on, on the yield. Um, that will have a big impact for the farmer, but also the industry across that and that as a whole, just as one, um, one example. We're getting uh, more and more satellites. Um, so we've got, um, yeah, I don't know how many satellites up there, but they're also, while we have a lot of people like um, But it also means that anyone can tell their story. Can, with the data becoming more and more available, um, you know, people can make their own maps um, and, and tell a story using that, that information. They can ask the question from their point of view and present something back to us. So I think that's fantastic that that can happen now. 
But what does it mean for national mapping organisations? Instead of telling you through my story, I'll tell you through um, the Dutch cadaster, which we, had, we, we keep in touch with quite a lot, um, because they've made some big changes in their processes of processing of maps. They, sh they shared me these slides. So in here, they're basically saying there's going to be a lot of automatic generalisation. All this large data, you need to be able to process quickly and generate maps. They currently have the ability to generate um, their, one, their 1 to 10,000, 25, 50,000, and 100K um, with the click of a button. So, which is a pretty impressive feat, um, given all the steps that go in, in, in that to go from such a large scale to, to such a small scale. They also need to work with their local um, councils, etc., to, to get their access to the data. So we have to work with standards and um, ways of um, sharing that data so that we don't capture it many times um, we can, and we can make it available to everyone. They have the same concept in there. Uh, getting, they're understanding the 3D space quite a lot, a bit more than we are, but they also acknowledge they can't do it themselves, so they're working in, in tandem with many, many people. And they also understand that, that the crowd has a part to play in all this as well. So they open street maps and they can see that there's a power for that to be, to be harnessed for a national mapping organisation as well. So they've started playing around and ex exploring that space. For any mapping organisation, I think that's pretty much the, the go. We, uh, we've seen it at, at many conferences we've been to, we hear the same things. Uh, that's this presentation from, obviously, from Dutch Cadastro and what they're thinking. It's pretty much what our thinking is as well, which you've seen in our strategy. What else does this mean? <coughs> for each of these steps, we are generating data. Um, although we have a specific want to produce the square earth down here, <coughs> at each step along the way, we're producing and managing data. And also along the way, there is someone who will want to release the potential out of that data that, that, is, that is left in there that we haven't taken out. And so we need to make sure that, that at all those steps, not just at the end, the map is available, and or just the data that we've extracted and interpreted, but all the bits that we've got need to be made available um, so that everyone can, can get the full potential out of it. And to do that, um, we need to understand users, we need to stay in touch, um, we need to respond to those users, we need to collaborate with others to achieve what we want, we need to embrace the crowd and, um, so that they can come along and, and add value along the way. We need to communicate and share what we're doing, um, how we're going, what we're thinking as well, so that we can do that in an open and transparent way. And, um, and fundamentally, I believe, we, we need to do data well, um, we, which means many things, but um, it's, a, it's a now fundamental to, to us uh, and what we do. And it also gives us as an organisation an opportunity to explore other things. What else can we do? This is just some images, again, created by Ian, using that Auckland data set and applying some colour. Um, you can get, you know, is this something we need to start doing as an organisation, allowing perspective views or perspective at interactions of 3D maps? Here's another just nice cartography that can be done. So what are the potential that we could do um, or others can do with this data um, and, and tell the stories, uh, different stories? Augmented virtual reality. I guess this is when you sort of squeeze the person in the middle between the earth and, and, and what we're producing. Just would share with you um, my wife bought it, brought home a book the other day for my son. It's, you can read the title there, The, the, the Dragon Hunters. These are two brothers. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware of this book, but um, if you open up the front cover, there's a map inside, which is in itself an interesting piece of cartography. But uh, when you pull your phone out and fire up an app, it comes alive. And you're staring through your phone, you get a 3D world. And I can move my phone around this map and, and get different perspectives. It's a video essentially, there's a couple of dragons flying around up here, there's one there, one there, and that's the two boys getting picked up by, by I think that's the friendly dragon, um, and he drops them in the water, yeah, and just observing this through my phone, um, but it stays pinned to the map, to the book, um, wherever I move the book or if I walk around it, it's all there, which I think is a pretty neat bit of technology. Um, it blew my mind when I saw it, and it also gave me a bit of inspiration. Imagine if you had one of our maps sitting on the ground, a you know, paper map, and you could put your phone over it and get a perspective and zoom around it, and you'd really have a different understanding of how, what the map is. Um, uh, that was just me playing around. don't know if we ever do that, but um, 
it's just cool. Like it's sort of those sorts of things do inspire, and I think we can take a lot from other people's perspectives and how they apply cartography and interact with it. Um, and I think it has uh, a value for us to take note of. Of course, then you have the augmented reality uh, um, setups um, like this, where um, I think it, you'll see they're becoming more and more popular. We've just seen um, last week, I think, or the week before, the Halo lens come from out from um, will be announced by Microsoft, which is promising a lot. Um, but it does look pretty cool what, what we'll be able to do that, how you interact with um, with your your home. Um, and other bits and pieces, virtual things, um, will be uh, interesting to see. And of course I can't go through this without mentioning Pokemon Go. Um, I have to say I didn't get in the bandwagon on this one, um, but a friend of mine turned up at my place um, and we were having a chat and, and he told me he played Pokemon Go. Oh, can you, can you show me? He said, yeah, and he fired it up and lo and behold, one of these things is sitting in my lounge and he throws a couple of balls at it and, and he caught it. Um, but it just sort of shows how, how um, that was a massive wave um, of people got involved into this. I saw a video clip on is it Central Park in New York where everyone just looked like a zombie walking into the park trying to get this key thing, one of these things. Um, but it just shows you how interactive this can be and how fun it can be as well um, when designed well. And, um, and, and yeah. So interesting to see how this goes. Will people be wearing, doing it with their glasses in the future or still running around with phones, who knows. Well, um, we're seeing screens bend. Um, if you go to, uh, go to a um, TV store these days, you can see the curved screens. Um, if you look at your, in your phone, some of them have the curved edges. Watches have the curved screen. So my question is, when will we see some digital paper? Um, where we can actually refresh a map um, but have the benefits of having it rolled out um, and interacting on a, on a big surface um, or be able to fold that all up and put it in my back pocket and pull it out later. Um, that I think would be pretty cool. Um, I don't know if it's possible but there's some pictures on the web about it so maybe it is there, who knows. If you want to follow us on Facebook you, you can see um, we, up, we notify our updates and our maps on there and there's often a time an interesting story. 